Over the years that we've held the ABSARD meetings, we've had repeated feedback that one of the most fun and enjoyable and informative parts of the meeting is a chance to talk to experts about how they handle complex situations, cases that are not written about in the literature or for which there are no real great evidence-based trials. Because as you all know, evidence-based trials tend to be very selective and we can't be selective in clinical practice. We have to see whoever can comes to see us and s sort things out. So let me just introduce our panel to be sure that if you haven't already met them. Um, so immediately to my, my left is, is, is Dr. David Goodman from Hopkins, a world-renowned expert in adult ADHD. We've got Dr. Mary Solanto, who's been moving around New York to different programs, is now at uh, NYU and who is a world expert in adult uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Next to her, needing no introductions, uh, Dr. Len Adler, uh, also from NYU, and Dr. Richard Gallagher. We've got an NYU uh, heavy panel here. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Jim McCracken from UCLA and myself, uh, and I guess I sort of switch hit because I see kids and adolescents and adults, uh, and I'm Tony Rostain from Penn. Many of you know I was in the pharmaceutical industry for decades, uh, and uh, my question really is, has to do not with the specific patient, but really uh, a broader uh, discussion about some of the complementary and alternative treatments. And Mary and uh, another gentleman presented two really excellent workshops uh, on augmenting the effects of using medication uh, in patients with ADHD, and whether it's hypertension or hypercholesterolemia or uh, ADHD, uh, what are some of the things that you would think about uh, both pharmacologically like omega-3s or other uh, alternative medicines or interventions that are non-pharmacological like yoga, mindfulness, uh, and uh, exercise or whatever that would be recommended to patients who are partial responders or not satisfied completely with the response that they're getting from their current medication? Oh, I actually want to make sure we include uh, Jim's work, I mean, Jim McCracken, because at UCLA, the alternatives looking at things like mindfulness is going on and other things, right? So why don't you well, start? I am from California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to hear the California perspective first. Sure. Um, well, I think there, there are several things that um, um, you might say have a lot of uh, face validity uh, to uh, recommend on a routine basis. I always ask a lot about um, exercise habits and recommend aerobic exercise highly um, to kids, uh, adolescents, and adults. I think that's very important. Um, as you probably know, there's a little bit of research supporting the effects of, uh, the immediate effects of exercise on attention and classroom performance. Um, a, a lot of parents, at least in LA, um, uh, are big fans of omega-3. I consider it harmless. Um, and given the, the sort of um, weak but trending positive evidence for omega-3s, uh, and, and um, uh, with the, the odd diets or uh, unusual dietary patterns that one can see in kids these days. I think omega-3s are a reasonable recommendation as well. Beyond that, um, there certainly are a lot of proponents of mindfulness as one technique. Um, uh, it, and indeed, some of my colleagues at UCLA did an open trial of mindfulness, um, published it many years ago. Unfortunately, I, I don't think there's really much um, that I would consider rigorous data to support it, but um, if you have a child uh, that, or adolescent that um, uh, is warm to such um, practices, I, I often do bring it up, particularly for um, adolescents or um, adults who have a lot of um, uh, uh, distraction, if you will, from negative emotions or you know, irritability, some anxiety that I may not um, be treating more directly. Uh, we have a very cool and easy to navigate web page um, 
of our Mindfulness Research Center with a lot of free download mindfulness scripts. So um, those are probably the top three or so that I recommend um, uh, on a fairly routine basis. I'm not a proponent of neurofeedback, although uh, there are even some of my colleagues who um, believe that that has established an evidence base. Um, I think that needs to be looked at more, and it, it, it's such a, um, it requires so much that I, I cannot uh, uh, just casually recommend it. Beyond that, other supplements I, I really don't have uh, that much familiarity with, um, but that's sort of my standard shtick in California. Anybody? Well, let me just mention, by the way, John, we had thought about holding a session at this meeting on complementary and alternative treatments, and we decided there wasn't enough evidence yet to talk about things like CogMed and these other computer-based, I mean, there's a whole lot of buzz out there about, do you know, does uh, luminosity or, or, or CogMed or any of those, but we decided we wanted, we couldn't yet bring together a group of experts to provide the kind of evidence that you saw in these other things. But nevertheless, patients are always interested in these things. So it's important to say, yes, you should investigate this. And for, I mean, at least the practitioners that I trust, obviously we use cognitive therapy at Penn because that's our thing, come in and get pills and skills and all that. But that being said, um, I think that there's some burgeoning evidence about helpfulness of CogMed for working memory training that may or may not be generalizable to all patients. And so the neuropsychologist that I trust the most in, in Philly who, who actually became a believer, Ed Moss, he was like a skeptic all along, he actually has treated a number of my patients and they've seen some small, small benefit. But maybe in the other part of the benefit is feeling like you're doing something, that you're actually taking sort of charge or you're this mechanism of agency over one's life that so many of us feel overwhelmed by the world, that might be also an, in a, you know, it's a, we could call that an indirect effect, this sort of feeling of self-efficacy that, oh, I'm now learning to use mindfulness or I'm learning to use some of the strategies that Mary uh, teaches patients or that we do, that that actually changes people's overall stance towards who they are, that instead of feeling like victims, and pills, by the way, don't make patients feel more like agents. They actually still, they might feel better, but they don't feel like they know yet that they're in charge of their lives. So that's the piece that I think any therapy or any adjunctive help ought to emphasize, which is, you know, despite this, we talk about like the, the goal for us is promoting resilience. So whatever shape or form it comes in, we're trying to help you cope better with the hand you've been dealt, knowing that life isn't easy and knowing that, you know, no one tool is going to fit, no one, no one treatment, no one tool is going to treat everybody e equally well. That's why the studies are, are harder to, to bring into the, into the clinical practice, because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I would like to comment a little bit about kids and adolescents who I mostly work with. Um, and I think that this idea of agency makes a big difference. Um, because the, the field is one that started with child and adolescence, there's been a lot of things that have tried and a lot of things that have a lot of face validity that really end up um, using up a lot of time and continue to be used. Um, and so I think we have the issues with social skills training that has been tried. Uh, we have. We do have information about uh, you know, biofeedback and, and CogMed and other things that look, again, like there's a lot of good face validity to them. Most of them have not been shown to be effective. I've done, I did about six years of research on social skills training uh, and, and found that that was not terribly effective. But I think what's important with kids and adolescents is for them to think that it has some face validity. Um, for the individual child or adolescent to think that this is something that's useful for me. There's many things that have been presented to kids and adolescents with ADHD and other conditions where you start to talk to them about how this might help them out and they get a glassy eye you know, view of it. It's like it makes no sense to them. Um, and I think unless it makes sense to the individual child, it's not going to work. Um, so I do believe that for some children, mindfulness might be appropriate. There's very little data on it. Um, there's very little indication of what developmental level would be appropriate for being able to take that kind of metacognitive stance. And I think we have to really be cautious because it is being proposed. There are books, there are, there are clinicians, there are persons that are developing programs for mindfulness for kids with ADHD. I'm pretty skeptical about that. Uh, but in the other realms, if the kids 
think that it's useful. <coughs> if an adolescent or an older, older child says, this makes sense to me, this might help me calm myself down, um, I think that that's, that's an approach that makes uh, some sense. If a kid can see CogMed possibly affecting them and possibly affecting when they're sitting down and doing homework, perhaps it's useful. If not, um, I, wouldn't, I would go primarily with the evidence and, and work in that fashion. Len or Mary? Uh, so I would separate out, obviously, cognitive behavioral therapy from other interventions because yeah. I'm blessed to have the two people sitting on either side of me um, at NYU, and we have access and can provide this, and the evidence basis for it is so much stronger than non other non-pharmacologic treatments. So let's just separate that off because sure. that's been brought in. Um, but I, I, you know, I... I I think taking a look at the intervention and what is the potential goal of the intervention and what is the potential harm and cost of the intervention should be brought into the equation. Um, I, I tend to agree with Jim that I think mindfulness for an adult probably can't hurt um, if you can try it. Um, I think they have a very difficult time doing what is required in formal meditation, though, the ability for them to kind of get into that place because of, I think, some of the executive dysfunction that often travels is a very hard thing for them to do. I have no data here. Operationally, though, I think that um, exercise, I, I, when I speak to patients about it, and I have no evidence basis here, so I'll just give you my clinical pearl. I tend to talk about it in terms of a more of a lumper than a splitter here because I think mm -hmm. patients will find what works for them. So some patients can do yoga. I think what I found is it's much more the proprioceptive and breathing yeah. portions of it in terms of awareness of themselves in the environment. Evidence, there's some evidence about Yeah, and yoga. there's some evidence to that that they find can often find helpful. And the physical aspects of yoga are something that can you know, because you're doing something, it may be a little easier for them uh, than just meditating. Uh, regular exercise is something we routinely recommend. Um, it, it, it's never going to hurt. Um, and then I think we have to hold these interventions to the stand. If we're going to replace our standard accepted for interventions with these, they have to maintain the same kind of rigor in, and uh, studies in terms of effect size and control um, that the others do. And we're adding them on, that's one thing, and what's the expectancy in terms of what you're getting from adding it on. But if you're going to do neurofeedback and do that instead of doing pharmacotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you've got to have the evidence that it works and it needs to be done in a controlled setting with that can be generalizable. Um, with um, an active control so that we know what we're getting. And I'm not sure we're there yet, and it's also expensive. Mary. But a very positive development in that regard is that NIMH has just funded a multi-site, large-scale, well-controlled study of neurofeedback in, a, in children on which uh, Gene Arnold is the PI. So Congrats. I think they were very wise to do that. But the caution is what Sanuga Bark and others have published from the European outcomes data of all those trials is that when you look at distal outcome measures as opposed to self-report measures, the effect sizes of all these things that we really, I mean, probably the most powerful effect size was eliminating dyes from the diet and all those additives. And that, you know, that doesn't give us much to go with then when you look at behavioral treatments, all the things that we think of as part and parcel of what we do, the psychosocial interventions, those, are, those don't stand up as well to these very rigorous meta-analytic um, you know, reports that we're seeing coming out of the U European uh, ADHD network. So I have to say, we don't want to sell snake oil, we want to always give p patients honest information. And to summarize, we all want them to find the things that work for them, but we can't, I would hate to say you should do that instead of what we know of. Yeah, and I know you didn't say that, but that, that's sometimes, sometimes people come in with that, like tell me why shouldn't I, should I go and do this or not? And I go, you know, if, you, if it makes sense to you, maybe, but it's still too early. To, I I'm really looking forward to that biofeedback trial, though. I, 
that's really, and Eugene Arnold was here several years ago. He gave like one of the most densely packed talks on complementary and alternative medicine. He's the go-to person when it comes to that. So, so my summary on this is um, when there's little data, the discussion are endless. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the, uh, the intensity of the affect in a discussion is inversely related to the uh, significance of the topic being discussed, the impact of the being. Okay. Okay, everybody, thanks for your attention, and please, please tell your friends about this organization, fill out the forms, and hope to see you next year at our meeting. Take care.